Hey listeners, before we get started, I wanted to share with you a brand new podcast that you might be interested in. It's the new Braves Dugout Podcast. This podcast is about all things Atlanta Braves baseball. They talk about roster moves, potential trades, game recaps. Now this may all seem cliche for a sports podcast, but they also include a special segment each week where they talk about controversial topics using only stats and logic and no bias. Controversial topics such as which Braves player should or should not be in the Hall of Fame, why your favorite player may not be as valuable as you think they are, or how certain players you may not like deserve more love. It's the new Braves Dugout Podcast. You can currently catch this podcast. See what I did there? Catch this podcast on Spotify or on Anchor.fm. It's sure to be a hit. Fed up with your 200-year-old shell? Radioactive ooze? Got your shell feeling claustrophobic? Why not spend your twilight decades in a new shell courtesy of WTMNT and Leo Productions on the all new television program Turtle Home Makeover You'll be the talk of the pond with your all brand new double wide shell These shells can provide protection from all types of predators, shredders, and bebops. Turtle Home Makeover! And don't forget, while we renovate your shell, you get to stay in our state-of-the-art Air Jordan Shoe. While using our Air Jordan Shoe, you'll be able to run faster, move quicker, and jump. There is also arch support for your diaphragm and pumps for added comfort and cushioning. Turtle Home Makeover! Each of our shells are created and handcrafted by the bodacious designer Donatello. Turtle Home Makeover coming soon to a sewer TV near you. This program is part of Splinter Productions. Cowabunga, dudes! Everybody and welcome to another exciting, fun episode of the Above Average Joe Show. Today we have a guest that has worked on a dozen or more different projects. A lot of them are very big name projects, including The Walking Dead, Fast and Furious, Godzilla, King of Monsters, Hunger Games, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, and Jumanji: The Next Level. Black Lightning, The Gifted, and the upcoming Jungle Cruise, which because of NDAs we won't get to talk about, but it is coming out soon. Our guest today is none other than John David Bulla. John David JD, as we like to call him in the industry. JD, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Joe. How's it going? 
I am doing well. I'm doing awesome. You staying safe down there? Yeah, yeah. Wilmington, we have a beach here, so it's nice to be able to go to the beach and enjoy the sunshine when the sun is out and the water is nice. You know, it's it's great times. It's a lot of fun to stay outside because everybody is seeming to stay inside these days because of this uh, unfortunate pandemic that we're all in. Yeah, for those listening that might not be listening anytime recently, we are in the middle of July 2020, so we're still, I'm guessing, in the middle of the pandemic because we really don't know when the end is, (laughs) Um, but we're a few months into this pandemic at least, Uh, so things are a little bit different and crazy. But to focus more on JD, uh, JD, I ask all of my guests when they first come on how they got started in the industry. What is your backstory and how did you get into film? Funny story. I was um, actually a hardwood floor sales rep and I was hanging out at my house one day and my buddy came over and he's like, you got that look, uh, revolution is coming to town. And I'm like, what are you talking about revolution? And he's like, well, it's an NBC project and they're hiring extras to be uh, militia soldiers. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Italian, Irish, Middle Eastern to some, some extent as well. So I have dark olive skin and dark hair and I, my hair was starting to grow out a little bit. I had a goatee. So I sent in my headshot and sure enough, I got, I didn't get hired as a Melissa soldier. I got, I got hired as a, a, a high end swanky, like, um, suave person. Wow. And, and so like, like basically the way the story goes in revolution, the power goes out and we all get sent back into like, you know, civil war era time. But the one area that was in the storyline of actually Atlanta, we were a bunch of city slickers. So they, they gave me nicer clothes and I looked like a city slicker. Well, then after two days of filming, uh, the casting director, who I was a close friend of back in college, she contacted me and she's like, hey, JD, are, are you willing to come on board full time to Revolution? And I was like, what do you have in mind? And she's like, well, I can put you in as a militia super soldier. And I was like, okay, cool. And so I started working four days a week and four days a week in film industry time on revolution was on average of 15 to 16 hours a day. Wow. That's a lot for, especially for a background. Background usually does not get recurring roles like that so often to where they have consistent gigs every week. Yeah. So, so revolution was filming from January till April and then we had a hiatus and then we came back in late April and then we finished out the season. In the meantime, while revolution was going on, Wilmington was exploding. They had just finished filming Iron Man three. We're the Millers. Uh, some other projects as well. And we knew that Under the Dome was coming into town. Uh, We knew that Sleepy Hollow, the first season, was was coming into town. And a lot of other indie movies and a lot of Hallmark movies were starting to film. Uh, Another another film that I was on called The Remaining was coming into town, which is, you know, a a graphic novel, sci-fi novel, that was actually religious-based about... Uh, the remaining people after the rapture had actually hit the small community that we were we were in fictitiously. And starting from a revolution from like the 16, 1700s up to a revolution in the apocalypse, you worked on The Walking Dead for a while. Tell us about working on The Walking Dead and how it changed your life. Wow. Uh, okay, so so I sent in a blind blind submission. It was called Strong Tough Look for The Walking Dead. And I sent in the submission. And, you know, at the time it was 2015. So I'd been an actor for almost a full two years. And I had done tons of different projects. And uh, my hair had gotten longer, a lot longer. My, my hair had gotten down to a little bit past my shoulder and my beard was bushier. 
And so I got an email back from the casting director two weeks later. And in big, bold capital letters, it said, the director loves your look. Here are the dates. Are you available? Because this is what's going on. Everything's top secret. I can't discuss anything with you, but we need to know if you're available. And so I said, yeah, sure. I checked my, I checked my other schedule. Um, I was available. And so I went down and the walking dead surprised me when I got to set, they were like, you are now a savior on the walking dead. And you are not only just a savior, you are a co-leader of the saviors. So you are literally a hero savior. And Joe, you, you and I both know that in the industry, you have the principal, you have the supporting actor, you have the day role player, and then you have the hero. <laughs> Real quick, at this point, did you know who the saviors were in the storyline, or was this like at the beginning before they were introduced? No clue. Had had no clue. My my good friend Drew, who was the PA that day, said, "JD, you've now made it in the industry." And I was like, "What do you mean I've made it in the industry?" He's like, "This is going to be the career change of your entire life on The Walking Dead." And I was like, okay, let's roll with it. And so immediately um, I, I was being treated differently by the higher ops. I met Greg Nicotero on that day. He explained to me my character and how important my character was in the storyline. He explained to me about what was going on in the scene where I was taking an AR-15 machine gun rifle and I was firing it up in the air and doing warning shots <laughs> against Rick and Abraham and Carl and all the rest of the gang that was in their Winnebago. Because the scene looked like this. I was with my 14 or 15 other saviors. We were blocking the road so they couldn't get, us by, get by us. So in the storyline, the saviors were roadblocking all the different entryways, all the different roads going out. So we could funnel them back only to one area, back to Negan. I am Negan, the most villainous character of Walking Dead comic book history. We will post a photo of that shot. We have a screenshot of you blocking the road that we will post on our social media. Keep going. Yeah, that was my debut episode which was on season six season finale, uh, which was the most watched Walking Dead episode ever with what I was told. Then we went into season seven, episode one, where both of those episodes coincided with each other. So at the end of season six, episode 16 it was a cliffhanger into season seven episode one and that's where negan was introduced and so i went on and did that episode and then i did another two episodes after that but what happened was i had to hold that secret of who was going to be murdered and slaughtered on on television it was psychologically draining uh, to watch it over and over and over again, and then to be put in as a villain. I mean, I had been a villain on some other shows before, but nothing like this. This was the ultimate villain role I had ever taken on. It was truly an experience that I will never forget. In fact, when we first started recording the first episode, it was rainy and cold. The first part of the of the episode one of season seven was also really cold and dark. It was like 32 degrees outside. I'm sitting there and I'm holding this gun and my hands are shivering and we're freezing. When we came back and filmed the rest of it in April, it was 80, <laughs> it was 80 degrees. 
Uh, it was it was unbelievable. Then when we knew that season six, the final episode, was actually going to come out, we celebrated at Nick and Norman's. A bunch of saviors got together, and my buddy CJ comes up to me and he's like, he's like, JD, have you seen the new Walking Dead magazine? And I'm like, no, I haven't seen the new Walking Dead magazine. And he's like, look, check us out. <laughs> and so it says introducing the new world order with Negan, and then we are literally in the backdrop that same screenshot that you're going to share with your fans and 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 our fans you know it was unbelievable i was on a double centerfold with negan they used that that shot of us on their facebook page on every social media platform that the walking dead was involved in as well as introducing us on the talking dead they introduced us there as well as the next Comic-Con in San Diego. So my friends were calling me, they were texting me, they were saying, JD, you're all over the place. You, you know, you, you, definitely, you definitely have made a splash in, in the career with The Walking Dead. And then talking about conventions, uh, you've been to conventions, not necessarily as a guest with a booth and everything, but you do something a little bit different at these conventions. Tell our listeners what you do at these conventions and how it's a little bit different than your conventional guest. Yeah, so so basically, you know, I have some of my friends that actually have booths and they go there and they sell their screenshots and well, actually, they don't sell anything. They just promote themselves. Um, they, I mean, they do sell their headshots and stuff like that because they're allowed to, but they don't. They we're we're you know. With the NDA agreements and everything with The Walking Dead, we have to ask permission to to sell anything that they own the copyright for. So basically what I do is I go there and I support my saviors, my walkers, the other groups that are on The Walking Dead. And I walk around and I introduce myself to directors, producers other comic-con people so i introduced myself to some of the other cosplayers and stuff like that and and believe it or not it's pretty interesting because right now before the pandemic occurred i was on pace to really do some amazing things this year with speaking roles i actually have been asked to do a screen test in the very near future on a huge project and I met this man at a Comic-Con. He's a legendary director, writer in, in Hollywood, and he owns his own production studio. And I can't really talk about it. But, yeah, I was able to meet him at the Grand Strand Comic-Con in Myrtle Beach. And we got to know each other and became friends immediately. And um, he said I would fit really, really well with this new role that he's been looking at doing, um, as well as another new project that's similar to The Walking Dead. It's an apocalyptic era, uh, so I've been asked to do that as well. But as you know, Joe, everything has been postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, unfortunately. But you had the chance of fighting in the Revolutionary War. You have fought post-apocalyptically with zombies and with humans. And... You've also fought against a radioactive lizard, gigantic radioactive lizard, amongst other beasts, uh, in Godzilla King of Monsters. Tell us a little bit about working. Well, we actually got to work on it together. So this is one of the projects that we did together. Tell us a little bit about your experience on Godzilla King of Monsters and how, how much you enjoyed that. Well, that was really interesting because... You, you guys asked me to go to boot camp, and I had never been to boot camp before in my entire <laughs> life uh, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, do military formations and shoot shoot guns and with blanks and, and stuff like that. You know, I was able to shoot blanks on The Walking Dead, but Godzilla was a little different because I was part of the mercenaries, the mercs, the villains, the bad guys. Um you know, uh, uh, Jeffrey that, that plays, um, Taron Lannister, um, I believe that's his name on Game of Thrones. He was our boss, uh, Jonah. And, um, it was really cool to work with Millie Bobby Brown as well from Stranger Things and, uh, um, Vera, 
um, uh, from from uh, the from lots of things, <laughs> from, from tons of different things, right? The Departed, uh, you know, the the Conjuring, and and stuff like that. It, it was really cool because I had not done a lot of green screen like we did on Godzilla. I made tons of new friends on that project. And what was really cool was I became out of the mercenaries. Um, there were a top four and I was always in that top four. At one time I was number one, then I was number two. Then I went back to number one. Then I, then I became number three. Then I went back to number four. And recently you had Zach on the show and, and Zach, you know, Zach and I were flipping back and forth, you know, with a couple other people as well. And it was really cool because the director would keep us at these different numbers and it would allow us to get more screen time throughout the process of Godzilla. So when it was all said and done, at the end of it all, I got amazing screen time on Godzilla. One of the most amazing scenes is where I'm able, it's in Antarctica, where I'm able to put in an ice bomb inside an ice cavern where I was one of the ones to actually ignite the bomb awakening King Kadora. So that was really fascinating. So explain to our listeners now, because we shot this in Atlanta, and you're talking about a scene in Antarctica. We shot this in the middle of summer in Atlanta. How do they, on a film set, make Atlanta into Antarctica? How were they able to pull that off? Well, if I remember correctly, we were at Black Hall Studios in Atlanta, and they made sure we felt cold. They they gave us a wardrobe that, that had very, very thick uh, lining and Arctic suits, and they literally dropped the temperature in the studio around 34 to 40 degrees. They couldn't drop it so low because the, the cameras would start freezing and then you would have frost and all that stuff. But they literally made us feel like we were in Antarctica because on another scene we were doing where Mothra was involved and the mercs were coming in and we were blowing up the door and we were entering and we were kidnapping the scientists and everything else. That was 100 degrees plus because <laughs> we were in South China. In, in that scene. So it was really cool. You know, the special effects people with the snow and everything and the green screen was amazing to, um, you know, it's, it's just amazing how movie magic works. The more and more that I'm on set, it, it seems like every day that I think that I've seen everything, once again, technology takes it to a whole nother level. And we went from zombies to lizards and now we're going to segue into what is probably not the most likely direction. <laughs> but let's segue into Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Because you've been working as Jesus quite a bit on a new show. Yeah, it's it's supernatural. Yeah, it's it's the longest running Christian faith uh, show in the world. The studios are out of Charlotte, North Carolina, so I stay local in North Carolina. Uh, you know, it's funny because... When when I've been dreaming of these things for several years, I always wanted to play the role of Jesus. And the more that I started growing my longer hair and my beard, I started realizing, you know what? It's time for me to take on the biblical spiritual characters. And so uh, my first role on It's Supernatural was Judas. And then I came back and it was King David. And so I got to play King David and I got to play Judas. And then all of a sudden, you know, I had my first speaking role in 2014. And that's really young as an actor, your first year getting a speaking role right out of the gate. It wasn't SAG, but it was a speaking role. And I played a pharmacist of all of all things, a doctor, <laughs> right? For this back gel. That was like, you know, this amazing creation that they created. And so actually, I was on the set with you on Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part 2, when I got that phone call that I landed that gig. And so that was my first ever speaking role. And so throughout the years, I've gotten more and more speaking roles. But lately, in the last two years, 
I've steered away from being an extra where I've done nothing but featured extra work, nothing but supporting roles and also lead roles. And so um, Tara, out of It's Supernatural, she emailed me and she's like, JD, I have a role for you as Jesus and you're going to have lines. And I was stoked. I was totally <laughs> stoked. And then so so I became Jesus. And, and so they see me as the original Jesus, the, the Jesus that is the Middle Eastern Jesus, the dark hair, the olive skin, not the Jesus that is portrayed out there as blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. OK, so there's a couple of different Jesuses that are being portrayed on its supernatural from the old time Jesus to the new era Jesus, which is kind of unique. So every time they need the older looking Jesus, the original looking Jesus, I guess you would say, they call me up and they ask me to do a speaking role for Jesus. So it's been really cool because they put makeup on me where I have nails in my wrist, I have nail holes, and I have nail holes in my in my feet as well. So it's been a, a complete blessing beyond belief to portray such an honorable character throughout the history of our world and our universe and beyond. Uh, so let's go ahead and get things wrapped up here real quick. And before we say goodbye to everybody, we need to do a little plugging for you. Um, what kind of social medias or websites can people go to find out more information about you? And you also wanted to talk a little bit about some cards that were available. So wrap that all into one before we say goodbye. Oh, yeah. So so I'm not really that keen on social media. However, I do have social media on, you know, through Instagram at JDBRasta. R-A-S-T-A. Those are my initials, John David Bola, J-D-B Rasta. And then TikTok, I also have a small account on there at J-D-B Rasta. And then um, recently, uh, Mark over at the Dead Cards com www.thedeadcards.com um recently has been taking images of of what was basically uh taken by uh my own self and also my mother agent peter bennett who i'm represented by uh model scout bennett he he came up with the idea of taking an image and having us with props and so, uh, you know, many times I'll be on set and I have a prop in my hand or uh, my, my buddy has props himself. So, yeah, uh, he came out with the dead cards. And so um, I have the dead cards as savior number 13 on uh, action cards. Uh, you know, as an OG savior from The Walking Dead, I'll nice. send you some pics so you can, you know, share them with your with your fans and and all the listeners as well. Yeah, that's in, that is incredible. Um, so thank you again, JD, for hanging out. It's been great catching up with you because it's it's been half a decade since we last talked. <laughs> oh man, it's been it's been so long, and yeah, it's uh it's great to catch up with you too, Joe. And I look forward to next time. The pandemic has halted our industry. Uh, as of this week, Atlanta started filming again. So uh, you know, I've been submitting some to some different things, and and we'll see what happens. Blessings to to everyone that's listening, and just stay positive, and always know that love is amongst us, and that's the number one thing that we need to spread throughout this realm and world. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in, and we love you all, and we will see you again next week with another amazing episode of the Above Average Joe Show. Thank you again to our special guest, J.D. Bulla. And a special thanks to Jamie Lynn Cattrett for her contributions to the Turtle Home Makeover Fomercial. Be sure to check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitters, and look us up on Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. You can also check out another podcast I co-host, The Extra Unordinary, and other great media content by Moon Possum Productions at moonpossum.com. <laughs>